Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. This morning, our guest is Nancy Collier. She's no stranger to the OPT Network. She's a psychotherapist in private practice. She's an ordained interfaith minister, mindfulness teacher, relationship coach, author, and blogger. And she joins us to talk about an incredibly important conversation. If you are having thoughts and anxiety, this is a conversation that you absolutely have to connect with. Her book is entitled, Can't Stop Thinking, How to Let Go of Anxiety and Free Yourself from Obsessive Rumination. Nancy, good morning and welcome back. Good morning. Nice (laughs) to be here. And so I thought the end of that excessive rumination was really interesting. Why did you add that? Well, rumination, right, this way that we go over and over and over, I love the way you said it, you should come on the road with me, Um, is, is just so chronic. I mean, it's so chronic. And while rumination is not the sexiest word, it really is what we do. It is what we're addicted to, to go over and over and over, usually the same problems, Mm -hmm. the same situations that we cannot solve. And yet we continue returning to them again and again, imagining that we're going to have a different result. Mm -hmm. So I could not leave that off the cover. Mm -hmm. And so in your work and on this journey, you get to talk to a lot of us, and I include myself in that group of people that have so many thoughts. One of the things that you wrote about that I thought was so incredibly interesting is becoming addicted to your thoughts. We are. I mean, what's what's remarkable to me is that we think addiction is just, you know, to drugs or to alcohol or to whatever exercise and these sorts of things. But in fact, the thing that is right in our face that we can't stop doing, we really can't stop doing. And unlike all these other substances or activities, we never take a break from. We take a break from Mm -hmm. an alcoholic occasionally isn't drinking, an exercise addict occasionally isn't exercising. We're never not thinking. And so when we look at an activity like thinking where we want to stop, We keep telling ourselves, why am I still going over this? Why can't I unstick from these sticky thoughts? But we can't. That is an addiction. And if you go to the DSM, which is sort of the Bible of all things psychological, and you look through what is substance abuse disorder, we are not mild. We are not moderate. We are extreme in our addiction to thinking. And it's funny, when I was first talking to people about doing this book, and I floated that idea, right, how to break this addiction to thinking, it was remarkable to see how how much resistance I ran into, how much people resist the idea of being addicted to thinking, you know, what's so good for us, we would never want to stop, you know, well, what kind of world would we have if we didn't blah, 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 we're very attached to thinking. And I was, of course, not suggesting that we stop thinking, that's not possible. It's it's not like an alcoholic um, giving up booze. It's not about stopping thinking, it's about changing our relationship with our thoughts. That's all. So Mm -hmm. thinking is an incredibly useful tool and we would not want to give it up, but it's about not being driven, not every moment of our life being determined by what nonsense our mind is sort of burping up and having to follow every thought that appears. It's just about creating freedom in our life. And then we use thinking for when it's useful. I've got to make a grocery list. Mm-hmm. I've got to make vacation plans. I, I use my mind to think when I wrote this book. Mm-hmm. But people really get angry when you talk about thinking as an addiction. But what's just the last thing on that, Carlette, one thing that's fascinating to me is if you don't ask people sort of in, in a in a formal framework and you just say, you know, do you ever feel addicted to your thoughts? The right answer from the gut, oh, my God. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. But then if you push them, they don't want their thinking taken away from them. Mm-hmm. I... I thought it was so interesting because I never really thought about my own relationship with my thoughts. And I thought it was really interesting when you wrote just what you talked about, how 
people were upset with you about thinking that you were trying to take their thoughts away or or thinking that they shouldn't be thinking. But but that's not at all what you're saying, is it? Nothing to do with it. And what I hope I get across in the book is that thoughts can keep happening, right? We have this idea in self-help and it's partially helpful, but it's partially destructive, which is that until we can control the content of our thoughts, we can't really be well. So we we do all this work to make negative thoughts, positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's great. You know, that's a good start. If we're going to make up a narrative on our life, we might as well say it's rosy rather than catastrophe. Right. right? But what I try and do is move a little bit past self-help to, in a certain way, it doesn't really matter what your thoughts are up to. We don't want our thoughts um, determining our mood. So because thoughts are very random and much of the time, the thoughts that are appearing are not thoughts we would choose. And so we want to develop an attitude towards our thoughts that is pick and choose. Does that seem interesting to me? Whether I like it or not, is it a useful thought? And that we are not so dependent upon being able to manage and make the content of our thought positive, right? Because if we think negatively and then we learn all these mantras and we learn all of these ways of thinking positively, as soon as things go wrong, um, it doesn't hold up. All our positive, it's like putting a hat on dirty hair. It doesn't work. Our positive thoughts quickly devolve into back into negative thoughts. So as a system, replacing negative thoughts with positive ones fails. So we need a little bit uh, more evolved and a deeper strategy, which is not being so enamored with the content of our thought, negative or positive. Of course, we prefer when the computer generates ticker tape that's positive, but in a certain way, it doesn't really matter. And that's what I teach people in this book, how to uh, not be so attached to their thoughts. They're not, to give up the idea that they are their thoughts, mm -hmm. that whatever comes down the pike is because it's a thought, it has to be believed. Because right. it's a thought, it has to be thought about. No, it doesn't. No, right. it doesn't. And and I think to that point, one of my takeaways from the, reading the book is that you are not your thoughts. And even though you think a thing, it doesn't mean that that's who you are. That doesn't mean that that's what you need to act upon just because you have this thought. And I think that's where so much of the, the anxiety comes in because we have a deluge of just thoughts coming at us all the time, especially, you know, depending on what your business is and, and how you live your life or just whenever there are just tons of thoughts there. That's really a wonderful point. And I think that's the central piece of the book. When you get it, that you are not your thoughts, then you don't have to investigate. You don't have to put so much weight in all your thoughts. What's funny is that because we have a thought doesn't make it true. Right. And it doesn't mean even that we believe it. I have plenty of thoughts I don't believe. Right. And when you get that, it's so liberating. You know, a lot of people, for example, have random intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot tell you how many people have random intrusive thoughts. So they're standing on the subway platform and they hear a thought that says, oh, I'm going to jump in or, oh, I'm going to push this person in or they're sitting in the theater and they hear, I'm going to yell out some crazy thing, right? Mm -hmm. But we have this crazy idea that, oh my God, it's a thought. It must have some deep, important meaning I have to go and unravel it and unpack it and understand the subconscious meaning of it and solve it. Because if I don't, I will be ruled by it. Right. Or I or I will become it. Let's take a break here. But when we come back, I want to unpack more of changing our relationship 
with our thoughts and how we do that and let go of some of the anxiety and some of the rumination that you talk about and that we all have with our thoughts. Nancy Collier is our guest this morning. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. This morning I'm talking to one of the most favorite people that I have met on this journey. Nancy, you are just such a calming presence to me. Before I even knew you, uh, reading the first book that I, I read that you wrote, Inviting a Monkey to Tea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because I never always remember the, the titles, but you are one of those people that make us think a lot deeper than what we would normally think. Mm. And so when I read the book, Can't Stop Thinking, I knew that the book was for me. It was written for me because I can't stop thinking. I cannot turn my brain off at night. And one of the questions that I posed on radio this morning to all of the listeners is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Great question. And so what do you say to that? What do you do when you just don't know what to do? Well, it's a perfect handshake, Carla, with can't stop thinking because our least favorite place as human beings is, I don't know. <laughs> our, least, our least favorite place. We don't want to yep. say we don't know. That's it. We'll, we'll do absolutely anything in our power to not reside in the I don't know. And so the mind that creates thought, right, a lot of what it's trying to do is to um, save us from I don't know, right? So it comes up with strategies, it comes up with plans, it comes up with potential catastrophes, whatever it's doing, telling us why things won't work out, why they will work out, what do we need for them to do, and so on and so on. Most of it is because the real answer is... I don't know what will happen. And if we start to understand, so our mind is chattering on and on and on about why nothing's going to happen and it's impossible. What we want to do is we want to come back to the present moment, take a breath and ask ourselves, are we doing everything we know how to do in this moment to make happen what we want to have happen? That's our first question, because we can do a lot of thinking, which can try and replace actually doing what needs to be done. If the answer to that is yes, Mm -hmm. then we need to take this really deep breath and say, and what will come of that? I don't know. I don't have the answer to what's going to happen. And that has to become a place that we can at least somewhat comfortably reside. All the thinking is trying to protect us from that very simple truth, which is I can do my part and then I have to turn it over to the universe and it's co-created where we go from here. That's the piece that I teach people in this book to, to really honor how difficult and existentially challenging that is for us to say, I don't know. I don't have the answer. You know, so much of what our mind is doing all the time with these thoughts is it's trying to figure out what's not working, to to solve problems, to understand more deeply so that we won't feel the way we feel. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the, the real peace does not come counterintuitively from thinking more about it. More thinking will let us figure it out. More, there's a diamond in this rubble. I know it, I know it. Even though I've thought of it 5,000 times, this time I'm gonna get to the answer so I don't have to feel the way I feel. But sometimes so, again, paradoxically, the answer and peace comes in saying, I can't figure this out. Mm. Not with more thinking, I cannot. I can do my part. And then I turn it over. Hmm. And that's exactly where I came to. But turning it over, and you write somewhere in the book that these concepts sound very easy or simple, but they're not easy. Nothing about this is easy. Every cell 
in our body resist saying, I can't do this. Not with what I know, not with who I am, not with what I have available to me. What I can do is my part and I can hope and I can pray and I can, I can hope that the results go the way I'd like, but I've done my part. And all of this obsessive thinking is really trying to fill that space of the rest is not up to me. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of this catastrophizing that we do, you know, well, if this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens. And the truth is we're preparing for, again, a catastrophe, which allows us to feel, well, I know that. So that's the way it's going to go. And then I'll be able to control that with this. It's all made up. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we're having the disappointment twice. We get to have it in our mind. Mm -hmm. And then if it happens, we, we get it again in some right. other form. But we don't have to have it at all. It's just an attempt to be in control. Right. And what I connected to this, this question that I ask, what do you do when you just don't know what to do? Is for me, I have to start to lean on my faith. As you said, I can only do my part. But what I have to realize is that, and I think what we all have to realize is, that with these thoughts, these thoughts could manifest or they could not. Exactly. You, you just don't know. And, and if we don't find a way to put these thoughts in, in the proper perspective and know that they're just that, they're thoughts, that they don't have to define what we do or what we will do or what we won't do, then we will always be on this vicious cycle of yeah. having this dance or this rumination with our thoughts. And, you know, there's another piece to it too, which I think is very important as we liberate ourselves from the identification with thoughts, which is compassion. You know, we always have to bring in this element of compassion. So where is the place for compassion here? The place for compassion is when we stop aligning with the thinker, Mm -hmm. And we are our thoughts. We script them. We author them. We're responsible for their brilliance. Mm -hmm. We're to blame for their evil, whatever story we have going. But who's listening to the thoughts? To whom are the thoughts talking? And when we shift there to, oh, my God, stop terrifying me. Thoughts, right? Stop. Why do you keep telling me about everything that's going to go wrong? The truth is, I don't know, and you don't know. Mm -hmm. So our allegiance, the side we're on, starts to be the side of the one that has to be hearing all this, mm -hmm. that's being discouraged and frightened and criticized by the thoughts, right? So if we're going to take any of the content to heart, we're taking it to heart through the eyes of the one that's listening. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the listener, mm -hmm. that's again, when we're starting to de-identify or disidentify with the thinker, and we're starting to identify with either we're the space within which the thoughts are happening, the awareness of what's aware of the thoughts, the witness. That becomes more of our seat. So we start to feel, oh, I'm the one that hears the thoughts. If we're not aligned with thoughts, well, now we have some separation between mm -hmm. us and them. And now we're starting to be in the driver's seat of our life. Mm. Wow. I want to take a break here, but you wrote something that I thought was so impactful about finding freedom in thought rather than from thought. And I want to I want to explore that, especially since we've been in a pandemic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people are having so many thoughts and some of those thoughts turn into suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. How do we help to free people from their thoughts? We'll talk about that plus more right after this. Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Nancy Collier and she has written a book entitled Can't Stop Thinking, How to Let Go of Anxiety and Free Yourself from Excessive Rumination. And so here's the dichotomy of thinking, Nancy. We need to think, but we need to be able to not allow the thoughts to overtake us. 
And here's what you wrote. You wrote, my goal is not to help you find freedom from thought, but rather to find freedom with thought. Thoughts yes. are not going away. So, so unpack that for us. So this is a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, when people deal with trying to change their thinking and so on. They think that the goal is to stop thought, freedom from thought, right? You're going to get away from thought. You're not going to get away from thought. Uh, you, you might if you have a head injury or you might if you become enlightened. But the, the, the mere mortals, the rest of us, right, we have this entity called a mind mm -hmm. that fires thoughts at us all day long, right? The mind's favorite thing, Christmas for the mind, is if you give it a problem to gnaw on. That's the most exciting thing because when the mind has a problem to chew on, it feels itself alive and we feel ourselves alive right? Because we feel that we are our minds. We are this little head. That's us. That's mm -hmm. who we are. We're not spirit. We're not body. We're not awareness. We're head. We're that. So when we're thinking, we feel in existence, if you will. So that's just the human condition. Why we're this way, I'm the wrong person to ask. But this ticker tape of content that the mind generates which most of which is random, 95% of which is repetitive. We've heard that thought before. We've heard that mm -hmm. thought. We've, it's very rare that we hear a new thought. But this is a delusion that that should stop. What starts to happen is that if you see those really big, sometimes the big sharks or whales in the ocean, and they've got tons and tons and tons of little minnows around them, and they don't they don't bother, they just keep on going through, right? Because there's an assumption that's just the way it is, the mm -hmm. minnows chase around me. Well, we can develop an attitude towards our own thoughts that's very similar. They're going on, they're going on, they're going on. Every once in a while we'll hear one as the hearer that is interesting. Oh, let me grab that, let me take a bite of that one, let me see where that, where that goes, right? But Freedom is not because the minnows stop swimming around us. Freedom comes when we're not that interested in what's happening in our mind. So it's a radical kind of adjustment to how we envision freedom. Freedom doesn't mean that the static and the noise goes away. It means that we start being aligned with this quiet space within which the thoughts are appearing. When you get a little bit practiced at being the witness to your own thoughts, because that's how it all starts, start noticing your thoughts, start mm -hmm. hearing them. If we're hearing them, we're not them. That's already success, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm being, my thoughts are telling me this. Do I believe that? Is that true? We start to question the veracity of our thoughts. But what happens when you start to be a witness to your own thoughts, not so aligned with them that there's no you and them, there's mm -hmm. only one thing, you start to notice that there are little gaps between thoughts. Are there silences when the thoughts are not firing? And that's when we're starting to change because that's starting to be freedom, freedom with thought happening. But we're starting to feel like you ride a bicycle. Oh, no thought is happening here. Normally, when we have a little gap after we've been meditating or witnessing for a while, we get really scared and the mind goes, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, where'd I go? Where'd I go? I'm not, I wasn't existing because I wasn't thinking. I didn't feel myself, which I only feel when I'm thinking. And so we fill it in. You know, who am I going to tell that I didn't have thoughts for a minute? Oh my God, I must be really spiritual. You know, whatever we fill it in with. Mm -hmm. But um, those gaps, as you witness your thoughts more and more and find more and more freedom with them, um, they, they get wider and they get more comfortable to hang out in. They don't, they're not quite so scary. The gaps start to be a place where we can experience ourselves as still existing, not just, oh my God, where did I go? Because I wasn't thinking. 
So all of it starts by just turning the lens on what's my mind up to? What's it up to? Could I be okay even while it's chattering? Hmm. And I think that we, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about those negative thoughts, mm-hmm. you know, because as thoughts go, like you said, they're, they're not, we want them, we would like for them to be all positive, good thoughts, but they're not. There are very much thoughts that are saying, you know, why are you here? You know, you are a failure or uh, nobody loves you or uh, you're being bullied or, or whatever those thoughts are that make you want to do yourself harm. Those yeah. are, are also thoughts that have to be dealt with. And I'm a little different than, than some mindfulness teachers in this way because I have not seen it work, truth be told, when we approach those thoughts with the same sort of not that interesting, right? Um, you know, like the thought that, you know, oh my God, what am I going to do this weekend or what's for dinner? They're very different than these, what you're talking about, which are core belief thoughts. And they say, you know, terrible things about us or they're, they're depressive or they're, they're deeply fearful or whatever they might be. We have to unpack those a little bit. So we have to understand what's the origin of those. Where did we learn that version of ourselves? We don't come into this world hating ourselves. So we, we, we do need to not only have deep compassion for ourselves to have to listen to these thoughts that tell us that we're worthless or tell us we should die or tell us nobody loves us or whatever. Deep compassion, again, for the listener who's hearing this message. But we want to a little bit at least, before we can not be so interested in them and dismissive of them, we want to understand who who taught me, who, whose internalized voice is this? Where did I learn this very unnatural core belief to make myself the enemy, which is not our natural state, and to disconnect from my basic goodness, right? So that needs a little bit of, we we often need an ally to do that with, or some sort of help, but some deeper exploration um, so we have an understanding of, oh, wow, that is my mother's voice, or that is my grandfather's voice, or, you know, wow, I really was taught that I'm worthless. And that's where compassion starts to be born. Wow, what if I could talk to myself differently than I was trained to talk to myself? You know, that's that's a process. But what we're doing all the time is we are stopping to believe that the thought is true. Mm -hmm. This is the basic premise all the time, which is because I have a thought, it means it's true. What we realize is much of that thinking, that really deeply core belief, negative thinking has been has been taught to us. Mm -hmm. It didn't belong to us when we entered this world. We've got to get behind it in that way. Mm -hmm. And then, wow, oh, my goodness. You know, that feels so unkind to talk to myself that way. When we when our heart breaks for our own experience, we can't hear those messages and, and align with them. We can't identify with them anymore. And that takes practice. And speaking of practice, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the techniques that you write about in the book that helps us to realign ourselves with our thoughts so that they don't overtake us. Nancy Collier is our guest this morning. Everybody stay on point. We're back with more right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Nancy Collier is our guest this morning, and every conversation that we've ever had with her, it makes us think a little bit deeper. And as we talk about thinking, we're talking about her new book entitled Can't Stop Thinking, How to Let Go of Anxiety and Free Yourself from Obsessive Rumination. Before we talk about the practice and starting the process 
of not allowing the thoughts to give us so much anxiety that they overtake us. As I was reading the book, I was wondering if you had just spoken to so many people on your journey that have so many thoughts that you thought that this topic was just so important that you decided to write about it. That describes it exactly. In my office, you know, people come in every day and talk about the externals. And God knows they're incredibly difficult externals. And this last year has been excruciating with that. And that is not to dismiss or, 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 or pretend that that's not real. Externals cause us suffering. But over years and years, decades of being a therapist, I have seen that it is really our own thinking that causes us the most suffering. Mm -hmm. What we do with our ex external experience and how we then think about it um, is equally painful, if not more, uh, than our externals. And again and again, day after day, I hear about people whose entire lives are just bouncing from one random thought to another, who have no autonomy in where their attention is, no autonomy in how their mood is. And it's completely at the mercy of what this mind is spitting at them. And so there's no more, to there, there, there's no topic on earth that I think is more relevant. And particularly during this pandemic, again, where so much has been out of control that the thinking mind to try and control what is not ours to control, what is, what is a complete opportunity for surrender, right? Do the best you can and surrender the results. Um, the mind has caught fire this last year in a way that I've never seen before. Mm. And, you know, I think you spoke about practices, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's it's really important to say that this is this doesn't happen overnight. We don't get free from thinking overnight. It took us however many years we've been alive on the planet to get to where we are. And it it really is a practice. It takes time. It's many, many glimpses, many times, right? We get a little sense of not thinking, of uh, being able to move away from thinking. We get a little bit better at it. We start to taste the freedom with thought. And it's over time that it happens. But there are certainly things that we can do to de-identify, disidentify, break away from thoughts so that thoughts are happening, but we're the one deciding what we want to do with them. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I hope that people will take away from the book just, or that I, maybe that I wanted to take away from the book, I should say, is that I don't want to become hostage to my thoughts and yeah. you can become yeah. a hostage to your thoughts because you're always, and you said it earlier in one of the previous segments, nobody wants to admit that they don't know how the next thing is going to happen. And so our minds conjure up these master plans yeah. of how it should happen when we just don't know. And so I don't want to be held in bondage by my thoughts. And you, you talk about awakening and, and, and being able to, to, to come to a place of, of a higher level of alertness, if you will. Well, we come to a place of awakening when we realize that we can actually determine how we want to be in our own life. You know, when we are hostage and kidnapped by every thought that appears, right, our day, again, is in this reactive. We're always reactive. We're always solving whatever problem uh, is uh, is given to us. We're not choosing those problems. The mind is just sort of, again, throwing those at us. So awakening, as I'm referring to it, is when we are identified with the witness to the thoughts. And then we have choice. We have choice. Where do we want to put our attention? And one of the great tragedies of, you know, being being hostage to thought is that it steals the present moment mm. from us mm -hmm. because thinking is always about the future or the past. 
we're always preparing for some disaster or we're ruminating over some disaster. <laughs> you know, those are pretty much our places. And neither of those take place here because when we're fully here and we're just experiencing this moment, right? Not planning for another one or trying to fix, right? If we're just here, there's not that much to think about. We're just kind of here mm -hmm. experiencing. Mind hates that. Mm -hmm. But the real tragedy of this addiction to thinking is that it kidnaps our now. Mm. And so one of the real practices, one of the great practices is returning again and again and again to right here. What's happening in my moment? Can I take a breath? As you were saying earlier, can I take a fresh breath? Mm -hmm. When we're fully present, we're not in the thinking mind. We're not future and pasting agenda. What's next? Blah, 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 blah. What's right here? We come back to now, right? So we're always watching the mind. What's the mind up to? What's it telling me? Do I believe it? Who's the mind talking to? That's the the step backwards, we call the backward step. Who's listening? Now I'm aligned with the listener, not the thinker. And then what's happening in my now? The body is always in the present moment. What's happening when I take a breath? What does it feel like? That is the antidote. That is the, the, the elixir to the overthinking and the ruminating and the anxiety come into the breath. It's so simple mm. that the mind hates it. The mind likes complexity. Mm. It likes lots of angles and, mm -hmm. and all of that. But this is just, when you come to the breath, we're not thinking. Mm. We don't even have to think the breath into happening. The body is breathing itself. So wow. we just have to tune in as the witness to the body's intelligence. That is so simple but yet we will try to complicate it. Yes. And it's just about being in this moment. Like you're in New York and I hear the horns in the background and my mind was thinking, but you know what I did? I brought myself back to the center and said, that is not what's important now. The importance is listening and being present in this moment showing up right now, not all of the external things that are happening, because see, the mind is constantly buzzing to, to, to take us out of the moment. It is. That's its goal. The mind is allergic to the present moment. Mm. It has nothing to do in the present moment. It can't feel itself as alive. And again, you know, I say this with a great deal of empathy for the mind. The mind imagines that it is us. It keeps telling us, I'm you, I'm you. Don't let me go away. Don't mm -hmm. let me go away. It's fighting for its survival. It thinks if, if it's not engaged, we die. So it's not malicious in that, in, in that sense. It, it's just misinformed. It's just misinformed. And, you know, because I, I, I teach mindfulness, you know, people will always say to me, oh, yeah, I, I'm really interested in, in being in the present moment. Let's, let's think about that. So what could be some exercises <laughs> and, and, you know, to-do lists and so on? Mm -hmm. And we'll do anything to resist. Take a breath. Drop out of your head. Unstick from the thoughts going on right mm. now. Pull away from them. And just drop your attention right now into your body. Just feel the sensations, the air against your skin. Notice the, you know, what your ears are receiving. Feel the weight. We'll do anything but to drop out of mind. Go mm. below our necks. Wow. Nancy, this is probably just the most profound way of looking at our thoughts and what our thoughts are driving us to, the anxiety, the uncertainty, the complexities. And it really, if, if we'll just lean into the thought that our thoughts don't have to control us, that we don't have to be bound by them, I think it would take some of the anxiety out of our bodies. Yes. And, and I want go can ahead. I finish go ahead. one I wanted to say one thing that I want your audience to walk away with too, and it's a very personal um tale. But I woke up after years and years and years of 
trying to figure out a particular problem and going over it and over it and over it in my mind for years mm -hmm. and arguing my case in a courtroom of one in my own mind. And I woke up when I got it that more thinking was not going to help me solve this problem. Mm. And once I don't, I cannot underestimate the power of when we realize when we're in the thick of thinking and we really believe that more thinking is going to help us figure it out and therefore suffer less and therefore feel better and therefore find a solution. I'm here to tell you on April 30th, 2021, that more often than not, more thinking is not going to take us to the peace that we're seeking. Hmm. And if you just trust me and do it as an experiment once, that moving away from what's bothering you and towards the present moment, what's happening in my here, actually counterintuitively, paradoxically, you throw all the words in there, is what brings us peace, mm. not more thinking. Powerful. The book, Can't Stop Thinking, How to Let Go of Anxiety and Free Yourself from Obsessive rumination. Nancy, before we got to go quickly, tell people how they can connect with so many of the things that you've written, your website and all of the resources that you have available. Sure. Best way is my website, nancycollier.com, one L. Um, any questions, go through there. And um, Psychology Today has my blog. I'll be all over talking about the book. The book is available on Amazon and um, look forward to seeing you for our next conversation. Indeed, right back at you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Hey everybody, stay on point. We're back with more right after this.